It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mayun Park. Um, she's not only a cardiologist, uh, she's a woman. <laughs> Guilty. And she's also the head of our division of heart failure. And she's one of the most recognized cardiologists in her field in the country. And I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, up to about two years ago, I was the chairman of the department for about 10 years. And um, I had to recruit a chief for the division of heart failure. And her name came up, and we started to look into her. We had some conversations over the phone. Uh, things were looking really good. But in doing due diligence, I called a few people that knew about her. And everybody spoke very highly of her. But one person I will never forget <laughs> said the following. Don't be misled by her body size. <laughs> her expertise and passion for her specialty are four times her size. <laughs> and since she joined us, uh, those words were absolutely true. So uh, it's great pleasure to introduce Dr. Park, who's going to take, talk to you about You Take My Breath Away, the so-called heart failure, which is a terrible term. You know, when you tell a person that they have heart fa the word failure ain't a happy word. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found any better terminology. It's now embedded even in the insurance companies. Uh, but it's a term that we always use with a lot of caution with patients because it has that negative uh, connotation. My Jung is going to tell you all about it. Thank you, Dr. Q. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's really wonderful to see all of you here and, and to see such a group of dedicated um, a community of women interested in their heart and their well-being. I mean, because, you know, let's face it, you lead your household, right? I mean, you uh, basically govern uh, what you, not only you, but your family does it for their dietary measures and, and, and their activities. So, I mean, the, as Dr. Quinone said, the better educated you are, the better you know, your family will be. So I've been asked to take, talk about heart failure, and I have spent um, over two decades in this field, uh, and we have come an um, amazingly long ways in our ability to diagnose and treat. But I gotta tell you, we still have a, a huge leaps and bounds to go. But the basic tenet, I has, as I've seen when I start to train, as I do now, a lot of this is in our hands actually in our, in our daily life, in our habits, in our practice. So I know that uh, uh, you've, you've heard a lot of the same messages you know, since early this morning, but I'm hoping that maybe I could put this in the context of how it, 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 it um, applies to heart failure. So um, what I hope to cover today is just overview of general heart failure. Um, and, and three uh, topics that I'll address briefly uh, with focus on women is heart failure related to pregnancy or peripartum cardiomyopathy heart failure related to lung artery disease or pulmonary hypertension, and stress-induced heart failure, Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy. Yes, stress can kill you. <laughs> um, so there's some really uh, scary and startling facts about heart failure. There's about 5.7 million Americans currently living in the U.S. with heart failure. And about over half a million new cases are diagnosed each year. So if, if you think cancer is an epidemic or other horrible conditions, Heart failure surpasses them all. Heart failure affects people of all ages, from children to young adults to middle aged to elderly. And about half the people who develop heart failure die within five years of diagnosis. So those are really frightening and terrible statistics. Now, what, does, what is heart failure? What does it uh, exactly designate? Now, heart failure is a condition. It's really a broad terminology. All it means is that the heart is not able to pump or fill with enough blood. Period. Very, very simple. And the, the, because of that, the heart muscle itself has to work harder to deliver blood to the body, and thus it can lag behind in doing its job in moving the blood throughout the body. So as a result, fluid can uh, back up into the body and, as, and into its, uh, uh, vital organs, so the, the blood as a whole do not get as much blood as they need. So as Dr. Quinones has mentioned, it's really a terrible term, heart failure. And it is misleading because you know, it's not that your heart has failed or completely stopped. It's just it's not working as well as it should. 
So this is just a brief lesson. I, 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 I'm sure you have seen this from our previous uh, uh, um, lectures, but how the heart works. And in a nutshell, uh, what you can see is that, okay, what you can see, am I, sorry, this is not, oh, of course, my apologies. What you can see is that the, the blood comes, uh, the deoxygenated blood or the blue blood comes through here and, and uh, it comes through the top uh, a chamber, this is the right atrium, into the right ventricle so that this is the right side of the heart. And then it, gets, it goes into the lungs to get the oxygen and it comes back into the heart to the left atrium and the left ventricle and then out to the rest of your body. So the two most important aspects that I, wa I want, to, uh, want you to have a, a picture of is that there are four chambers, two top chambers, and two uh, uh, bottom chambers. And the fact that the left ventricle, which is right here, is uh, designated as the most important and most powerful ventricle because this is what delivers the blood to the rest of the body. But uh, don't discount the right ventricle because if this does not work, then the, uh, then the left ventricle cannot work well either. So there are two. Um, uh, two main types of heart failure, and it's, and it's defined by the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction, if you remember, is by echocardiogram, and it's a number given when they do a study on you on how well your heart pumps. So there can be a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or it's called HEFREF, just like the way it sounds, or systolic heart failure. Systolic means systole is when the heart contracts, so that is uh, when the heart is supposed to contract and squeeze well. But if the heart is weak, the heart, when the heart pumps with this type of heart failure, it's not going to squeeze well. Now, the second type of heart failure is what we call preserved ejection fraction, or HEFPEF, or diastolic heart failure. Now, during diastole, so you have systole and you have diastole. So diastole is when the heart relaxes, so the, the blood has time to fill the cavities. So when the, but when the heart is too stiff and it's not able to fill adequately, um, it does not relax. And, and henceforth, the blood backs up and the people get short of breath again. So these are the two broad categories of heart failure, those with reduced uh, ejection fraction where the heart cannot squeeze. And the second one is where the heart cannot relax. Okay? And there are various different forms of the, uh, those two uh, types of heart failure. So common causes, I know you've heard of um, all of these uh, uh, etiologies, but just to note that everything, all common pathway leads to heart failure. High blood pressure. Blood pressure control is so, so important. We have so many great drugs, but you know what? We still do a poor job of controlling blood pressure. And that's because it takes effort. It takes actually a screening. You gotta actually measure it at home. And you gotta work with your doctors to make sure that your medication is exactly doing what it's supposed to do. But if your um, uh, heart has to work harder because it's, it's of the high blood pressure, over time it's going to enlarge and it's going to fail. So that's, that's the one way the heart failure can, um, can result. Coronary artery disease is what Dr. Kerma was talking about with all the stress testing and so forth. Um, it, and this is what causes the narrowing of the blood vessels. And you can see a, an example there. And it can also, of course, lead to heart attack. So when you live with uh, narrowed uh, damaged arteries and, and, and it, heart muscle does not derive enough uh, blood supply, again, over time, it can cause a weakened heart muscle and, and uh, heart failure. Heart valve disease. There's many number of conditions, including heart attacks, just simply aging and time, that can damage the heart valves. Um, so the valve become, can become narrowed, as you can see here, or it can become leaking. And both can, over time, uh, uh, put an undue pressure or, or, or um, stress on the heart muscle, and again, it can lead to heart failure. Cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy, just as general term, means there is something wrong with the heart muscle. And so it can be the structure or the function, um, uh, and, and, and it can uh, lead to a poorly working heart. And again, this is where the um, reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction all fit in. So what are the symptoms of heart failure? So you can imagine if your heart does not pump well, uh, you may not have the symptoms at first, but as the condition gets worse, it can cause shortness of breath, it can be with or without activity, um, even in lying in bed, and you may find that you know, over time you need more than one pillow, two, three, and, and for sometimes you even have to sleep uh, sitting up. Tired of weakness, I know this has been uh, termed a lot, but uh, uh, for heart failure, especially when you're trying to carry something, groceries for instance, going up the stairs, um, this causes undue amount of fatigue, and afterwards you just pooped out. 
lightheadedness or dizziness. And again, this all goes to the fact that your heart is not able to meet up with the demand. Racing heartbeat, when you're trying to do something, you feel your just heart palpitating inside of you. Swelling of your feet, ankles, and legs in your stomach. Again, because uh, uh, your heart cannot just deliver an, an, uh, 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 enough uh, blood supply to the vital organs. So how do you diagnose this? You've seen this. Um, the first thing that we do need is uh, to check out the electrical activity of, of your heart. We do this by EKG. Make sure that it's, it's coming from the right source and that it is indeed uh, going the right speed. Blood test called a BMP or N-terminal brain BMP. This is a simple blood test that you could do in the doctor's office or you can go to any lab. But there, is, uh, there are ranges where a normal heart without heart failure is. And if it's elevated, um, it really can detect that something you know, is happening because it's like a stress marker for your heart muscle. So this test is best done when uh, your doctor follows it seri seri on, serially on you. So if you have a baseline, and then you kind of maybe get another one three months, six months, if you have a library of your own uh, BMP level measures, that can really help your doctor to take care of you. Just x-ray, uh, it, it's really um, a helpful test to show that if there's a fluid in the lung, you can see some of the uh, fluff of vessels here. There's some fluid in here. And, but overall, this heart is really enlarged. A heart should uh, be uh, sit nicely in the, in the uh, cavity right here. So this denotes that this, this uh, person has enlarged heart uh, uh, size, and they, they're in fulminant heart failure. So echocardiogram, and, and I know you've seen this picture a lot, we do rely on these tests to really help us deduce, one, what is the heart, person's heart function? And two, how are the other structures working, like the valves? And, and is there any abnormalities that we can detect uh, uh, to determine or explain what's going on with a person's symptoms? So you can see that um, this is a short axis. You can see uh, this person actually has heart failure uh, and, and uh, where they actually, this person has right heart failure. But you can see this is the main chamber of the heart. Um, and this is another picture right here. You can see that this is the, the main left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, and this is the bottom two chambers. The other uh, important test is stress testing, and I won't go into this because uh, uh, Dr. Kuromayo just uh, uh, did a great job at this. But we do utilize this not only to see whether somebody has a blockage, but also to test if, uh, what, is, what your exercise ability is. Cardiac catheterization uh, to see whether you have any heart, heart artery disease, but also most importantly is to measure the pressures of your heart. Now this is important because um, if your pressures inside of your heart and your lung is abnormal, then your, your heart is not gonna be able to function right. And again, that's another cause why the blood can back up and, and, and it can cause heart failure. So there are many serious complications of heart failure. You can, you can imagine if some of your vital organs are not getting the blood supply, they're not gonna function well. So one is really uh, uh, irregular heart rhythms. This can lead to certain cardiac death. Uh, this can actually be uh, life-threatening. Kidney disease, very, very important. If you have heart failure, you gotta have working kidneys. If you do not, then, then really the uh, prospect is not good. Um, and if, you, if any of you, or, or, or hopefully not, but if you know somebody that's heart failure, the doctors follow the kidney function very, very closely. That's because we really have to make sure that with medication and with everything we're trying to do, that that very vital organ stays healthy. And, and can you, if somebody has a kidney disorder because of diabetes, for, uh, uh, say, and you get heart failure, treating both can also be a very much of a, a challenge as well. Liver disease, again, liver can uh, become congested if the heart does not work well, so they both can affect each other. And a lot of the medication, no matter what you're on, go through the liver. So if your liver is congested, it's not working well, then, then your medicine may not work well. So you can see that all of this is very much, much uh, interrelated. So can heart failure be treated? The answer is an astounding yes. And heart failure is a chronic condition. It really uh, deserves and needs a lifelong management. And with treatment, the heart uh, failure can improve, your symptoms can improve, but also the heart can sometimes become stronger. So I have had patients, actually many, that where their, their ejection fraction, that's, which is normal, is 55, 65%, but actually they, they uh, uh, actually uh, start low, but they actually improve over time. So what are some of the medications that we use? Uh, this table lists uh, some of the medication. The major one is diuretics. And this is what really takes the fluid out of your body, takes the fluid out of your lungs. And, and if you have fluid in your lungs, the first thing you're gonna uh, you know, feel is shortness of breath. 
The ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, that I've listed some of the names here, um, these widen the blood vessels and, and, and hence it kind of uh, decreases the load on your heart. So it makes the, the, the work of the heart easier. And uh, you, may, you may have heard, have heard uh, new medicine on, the, on, the, on TV, Entresto. That's the, the commercial with, you know, so the sun will come out tomorrow. Now, this is one of the new medicines where actually it has been shown to be very beneficial in pe uh, people with heart failure. And it can be used in place of an ACE inhibitor, and it's actually superior for those who can actually tolerate the drug. So your doctor may uh, discuss this with you as well. But this has actually been shown to be very bene beneficial. Beta blockers. Beta blockers have probably the most uh, uh, illustrious uh, history for improving survival of all the drugs that we have. And these are the two main medications, the Topro-Excel and the Corag. And it just slows the, down the heart rate, but most importantly, uh, it protects the heart from the adverse effect from your own body's uh, natural hormone release. That happens with heart failure. So beta blocker tends to decrease it, so you, the, the harmful effects are attenuated, and over time it can be reversed. And beta blocker probably has the, the biggest bang for buck, if you will, in, in helping your heart recover. Um, the MRA is another group of uh, um, uh, medication that it's a type of diuretic, but it also helps to attenuate that uh, hormonal release. And nitrates and hydrolysine, that's another type of medicine that actually uh, widen the blood vessels. And you might, you might have heard digoxin. It's one of the oldest medicines that we have in history, and it helps the heart to pump more with force. So what can I do to protect my heart? Um, I know you've heard about all this, but I must really spend a few minutes on the salt. Salt in, in the world of heart failure is our worst enemy. Honest to God, this is what really um, uh, spells disaster for a lot of my patients. Uh, you know, uh, results in hospitalization. Salt is like a sponge, and it makes your body hold on to water. Too much water, uh, salt in your diet can uh, uh, e equate to water weight, and water weight can make you swell. It can also put water in your lungs and makes you harder breathe. So salt is everywhere. Everywhere you look, in your grocery store, in your refrigerator, in restaurants, it is everywhere. And, and with heart failure, it is recommended that you take less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. So if you put a little bit of salt, a teaspoon of salt uh, from your, your shelf into, into your, your uh, food, you have just put 2,300 milligrams of sodium in your, in, your, uh, in your dish. So you can imagine that it takes a really a lot of effort to minimize salt in your diet. Decrease the amount of fluid. Uh, people with severe heart failure are often directed to drink less than two liters um, a day, and that's about 66 ounces of fluid. And monitor for change in your symptoms. Weigh yourself every day. Uh, limit the alcohol. Uh, not only is alcohol uh, makes heart failure worse, it's also not very good for your heart muscle. It's a direct toxic. Of course, quit smoking and tobacco use. Now, medicinal supplements, you know, the herbals and, and all of the uh, medicine that you could buy at CVS or Walgreens, um, some over-the-counter medications are not good for people with heart failure, particularly the ibuprofens and, and like the Advil, Motrin, and Leave. They really can um, interrupt the sodium and your kidney flow, and they can actually make the, uh, make the uh, kidney function worse and heart failure worse. So we tend to stay away from these class of agents altogether. Cardiac rehab and exercise. Now, I've gone through what not to do. This is what to do. No amount of medication that we have really can provide the benefit as much as uh, uh, exercise can. And this can be in a group, and this can be individually, at home, in a gym. No matter how much you can uh, do it or when, when you can fit it in, any amount of activity is better than none. So please, um, exercise is probably the best thing. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit to cover three small segments of uh, different topics pertaining to women in heart failure, and one is peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now, this is an uncommon form of heart failure that happens toward the end of pregnancy, about one month towards the end, or, and up to five months after giving birth. And this is a form of dilated form of cardiomyopathy uh, because the heart chamber becomes enlarged, and it leads to decreasing the amount of blood that's ejected, again, from the left ventricle to the heart with each conjecting beat, leading to less blood flow. So heart is no longer able to meet the demands of the body organ for the oxygen. Now, peripartum cardiomyopathy in the US, uh, Canada, it, it's rare. It's about 1,000 to 1,300 women develop the condition in, uh, each year. In some countries, however, it is much more common, and it may be related to difference in the diet, uh, lifestyle, genetics, or other medical conditions. 
So how is this diagnosed? Uh, it can be dif difficult to detect because symptoms of heart failure can mimic those of a third trimester pregnancy. Swelling of the legs, shortness of breath, being tired, does that sound familiar? Um, feeling of the racing heart, heartbeats or skip beats, and low blood pressure. So oftentimes these uh, uh, complaints or these reports are not adhered to or listened to, and then hence why the heart failure syndrome can uh, go on until the, a woman can become in trouble. So what are the risk factors? Um, age of greater than 30, but really this is not really uh, that strict because uh, it has been reported across a wide spectrum of age groups. Obesity, definitely a risk factor. History of other cardiac disorders, like inflammation of the heart or myocarditis. Smoking, a definite one. Um, alcoholism, multiple pregnancies, being of African-American descent and poor nourishment. So all of these are identifiable and proven risk factor for developing peripartum cardiomyopathy. Now I want to switch topics to pulmonary hypertension, and this is when the right ventricle falls, ventric uh, ventricular function falls. Now, as, as we covered, there are two types of, heart, of, of hypertension. There's the one that you know you go to your doctor's office and they measure it. They measure it through for your whole body, but this type of hypertension actually exists in your heart and your and in your lungs. So the blood vessels in your lungs have their own circuit, and these circuits really the pressure has to be kept low and it should be kept be, uh, below 30 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Now the pressure can go up in, in pulmonary hypertension, and when that goes up, what happens is that the right side of the heart right here can enlarge and become uh, dis distorted, and dysfunctional, and hence you go into a right-sided heart failure. Now th the reason why this is particularly more common in women is if you look at all the different causes or groups of pulmonary hypertension, the one we, we are going to uh, look at is group one because it's where we have all the treatments. You can see that uh, one of the causes is a connective tissue disease such as lupus, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis. And this is more common in women, about four to one female to male. And if you look at the overall pulmonary hypertension uh, population, majority are women. And this is, uh, this is the reason why this tends to be called actually a disease of the women. So another uh, problem that this is so difficult is you cannot really diagnose based on symptoms alone. Because again, they are very, very nonspecific, just like heart failure, shortness of breath, chest pain, being tired, getting swelling of the legs, palpitation and dizziness. And, and one um, that can culminate all of this is fainting. And I, when I have, I have had actually young women present to me um, at, and upon uh, syncope or fainting, uh, college age women or you know, those in their early 20s where they were healthy before and they just had been feeling well and they just passed out, going to class, going to their car, and upon evaluation, it, it turns out that they have severe pulmonary hypertension. But it's because they're young that they can actually carry on to that phase without you know, on any uh, prior uh, problems. But when this hits, it can really hit hard, and mortality is very, very high. The other problem is that because this disease sits right between your heart and your lung, it's often uh, bounced back and forth between the cardiologist and the pulmonologist. When, when you go to them, tell them, hey, you know what? I'm short of breath. I don't feel well. Uh, one says it's the heart, the other one says it's the lung. So there's really no defined diagnosis that's really made in a ready-made time. So uh, a lot of people get bounced back and forth, being misdiagnosed as asthma, you're out of shape, you should really lose some weight, you know, go, go out and exercise. So we do use uh, echocardiogram as a screening test, but you do need the right heart catheterization where we measure the pressures of, of your heart and your lung. This is the only way to make the diagnosis. And many, many treatments are available. Again, when I started uh, 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 as a trainee back in 1990s, we had zero medication. Now we have 14 FDA-approved medicines. So this is a definitely a treatable condition. It just has to be recognized and the diagnosis has to be made. And for those folks that we cannot manage it adequately with medication, we offer them lung transplantation when feasible. And again, the early detection is the way to go to treat this. Now I'll end with this, the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. It's also called the broken heart syndrome or stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, this was first described in Japan in 1990. And more than 90% of reported cases are women, uh, uh, post-menopausal women of ages 58 to 75. 
Now, uh, the features of, of Takotsubo are listed here. Uh, people present with chest pain and shortness of breath after some kind of severe stress, emotional or physical. Uh, it could be sudden illness, uh, loss of a loved one, a serious accident or natural disaster. Um, when you look at an EKG, really, it looks like a heart attack, you know, it, it, by all means. And actually, when you do a blood test, it looks like a heart attack, too. Uh, but when you do a catheterization, there's really no evidence of coronary artery obstruction. And what you do see is an abnormality in the how, how the heart moves. And that's what uh, really clinches the data. So how do you diagnose it? Again, you need, uh, you need uh, uh, evidence of angiogram without the blockages. And you need a cardiac marker that actually does rise, but it comes down fast, unlike a heart attack, where it goes up and it tends to stay up for a while. And echocardiogram, again, showing the uh, abnormal movement in the wall of the left ventricle. Again, it, it does a little bit of bounce that's different than any other condition. So how is this treated? Um, you know, standard heart failure medication really are recommended. And most abnormalities in the heart function in the left ventricle uh, uh, clear up in about one to four weeks. And most, most patients really do recover between two to three months. Now, death is rare, but some people do develop heart failure in about, uh, in about 20% of the cases. So I'm going to end with that uh, to say that uh, you can live successfully with heart failure. I think the, really the crux of the matter is that it has to be diagnosed and recognized on a timely basis. And one thing um, uh, is, is a lot of the uh, mistake that um, uh, some of my patients can make is because they feel better with medication that they skip, you know, don't, don't take the medicine. Please do not do that. You gotta take this medicine even when your heart is fully recovered and all the other, you know, uh, healthy uh, living habits. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for your attention.